Hello and welcome to the latest live stream from Oxplore. I am your host today. Uh, I'm Dr. Tom Crawford, a mathematician at St. Edmund Hall here at the University of Oxford. And also you may recognize me from uh, YouTube where I talk about maths on my own channel, Tom Rocks Maths, and also quite a lot with Numberphile. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about the big question, do aliens exist? Now, the uh, session today is being recorded. Um, and this will be available on YouTube for you to watch at a later date. We will try to make everything as understandable as possible, but because it's being recorded, don't worry, you can always go back and double check things later if needed. There'll be plenty of chances for you to interact. There is the chat function, which you can join in, and we do want you to send your questions for our panel, who I will introduce in just a moment. Uh, and I'm also going to be throwing out a hopefully interesting question for you uh, right at the start. And again, I do want to hear your answers. They'll come through on my computer, and I'd love to hear what you think about those as well. Um, there will also be a prize for the most thought-provoking question. So again, get those questions coming in, and do make sure you put your name and also the name of your school so we know who to contact when you hopefully win your fantastic uh, prize, and that will be announced uh, by the end of the week. So, we finished the housekeeping. <laughs> it's time now to meet our panel. So first up, we have Simona. Would you Thank like you. to say hello? Thank you, Tom. Hello, everyone. I'm Simona, and I am a default student uh, at the Department of English here at the University of Oxford. Um, my research concerns speculative texts that uh, borrow conventions from um, forms of mystery and detective writing. Awesome. And Hubert, do you like to say hello? Yeah. Hi, everyone. I'm Hubert. Uh, I'm a PhD student at the Oxford Internet Institute, uh, and I work as part of the project on democracy and technology, and we do work on misinformation. And uh, recently, in the last year, uh, two years now, I've been working a lot on health misinformation. I imagine you're quite busy over the last <laughs> few years. <laughs> it's a, yeah. OK, so, uh, and finally, we have Becky. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, my name is Dr. Becky Smethurst. I'm an astrophysicist at Christchurch here at the University of Oxford. And my research is all about how supermassive black holes grow, which I have a lot of fun doing. But I also have a YouTube channel like Tom <laughs> as well called Dr. Becky, uh, where I try to be your friendly neighborhood astrophysicist that you can um, ask all the questions you can't Google. And it's really good. I do recommend checking <laughs> out Becky's channel. Um, right, so we've got Simona. <coughs> looking at literature and I guess the portrayal of aliens and things. So any questions around that, send those in for Simona. We've got Hubert, misinformation, conspiracy theories, UFO sightings. Well, I'm sure we'll get some questions about those things. And then Becky, the kind of physics of it all, like astrophysics, space, all that kind of stuff. Uh, I, of course, I'm a mathematician, <clears throat> so I would like to tackle this question first by thinking about it from the mathematician's perspective. And this, of course, is a question that has been asked before. Do aliens exist? And the way we look at it from the maths perspective is, of course, by forming an equation. So we have this equation, which you can hopefully now see on screen, which is called the Drake equation. <clears throat> and it gives a way to estimate the number of civiliza civilizations in our galaxy with which communication may be possible. So the other possible civilizations or alien life forms that may exist that we can actually interact with. Now, it looks quite complicated, but if you look at each term individually, we can hopefully break it down and try to make sense of, of why we can construct this equation in this way. So the first thing, so we're trying to calculate n. That's going to be the number of civilizations we can make contact with. We then have the first term is r star. This is the average rate of star formation um, per year in our galaxy. So how many stars form per year? The next one, fp, is then given a star that forms, how many of those stars have planets? What is the fraction of those stars that actually have planets around them? Then we have ne, which is the average number of planets that could potentially support life. So you need a star to form. It has to have planets. Those planets need to be able to support life. So you know, not too far away, not too close. They have to have the right temperature, the right kind of atmosphere, that kind of thing. Then <clears throat> we have um, F1, which is the fraction of those planets that actually go on to develop life. 
not all planets that can support life will actually develop it. Then we have um, Fi, which is the fraction of the life that develops that is intelligent. So, you know, you could have life, but is it intelligent, sort of? And here, I guess, we're thinking kind of similar in some sense to humans. Um, then we've got Fc, which is the fraction of those intelligent life forms that will actually go on to develop enough to be able to communicate across space. And then finally, we have L, which is the length of time for which those civilizations that can communicate are actually sending those signals out into space. So there's a whole load of information that goes into the equation. And of course, a lot of these terms are quite uncertain. And Frank Drake, who first came up with this equation, first person to write this down, um, he actually came up with a number at the end, which ranged from one being us to possibly 500 million. So we're all very interested here on the panel to hear what you think. How many other possible civilizations do you think might be out there that we could interact with? So type your answers in the chat and I'll have a look through. Uh, and maybe towards the end, I'll have a bit of a discussion about some of the different numbers um, that you've all come up with. So that's how we do it from the maths perspective, <laughs> trying to quantify the answer of uh, do aliens exist? How do we do it, Simona, from the English and literature perspective? Thank you, Tom. Um, well, needless to say, um, especially when it comes to such a big question as do aliens exist, we should not look at fiction for straightforward answers. But what fiction and what science fiction specifically is um, especially suited to do is provide an imaginative space where we can test out answers. So for example, what if aliens exist and they come to Earth looking for food? And that's a scenario you find in the World of Worlds by Wells, for example, but also in a more recent work of fiction such as Under the Skin by Michelle Faber. Or again, um, what if aliens exist and they form together with human beings a galactic federation? That's the entire Star Trek franchise. Conversely, what if they do exist, but they're only interested in Earth because it's a nice place to stop and have a picnic? And nonsensical and strange as it may sound, that novel actually exists. And it's called Roadside Picnic by the Strugatsky brothers. Um, so besides the apparent entertainment value of all these possibilities, I think what this variety really tells us is that um, we are attracted to the alien in fiction because it's such, such a flexible um, uh, icon. Uh, it allows us to express a lot of concepts. The alien in fiction has been used in almost every way imaginable. It's been depicted as the invader, and I've already mentioned World Worlds, or um, on the contrary, it can be depicted as a victim, as uh, part of an oppressed people. And that's, for example, uh, the scenario you find in a recent movie such as District 9, a fantastic movie. Um, another very typical scenario is that of the alien as watcher, the alien as guardian of the human race, not necessarily in a benevolent sense, and that's, that's the kind of idea that often comes up in the work um, by the British writer Arthur C. Clarke. And it's quite well known that Stanley Kubrick took inspiration from a short story by Clarke for his cult classic, A Space Odyssey. But what is, also, what is also interesting about this kind of idea, this kind of mysticism, that uh, surrounds the alien is that um, this, kind, this kind of mysticism informs also cultural phenomena such as the UFO mania of the 1950s or uh, movements that are sometimes called science fiction religions such as Scientology. So here again is the, the key, I think, to understanding the cultural currency and the appeal of the icon of the alien. It's extremely prismatic. It can be made to signify pretty much anything. Um, and there is a critic who has said that um, the reason why we need aliens in our imaginative landscape is that we are aliens to ourselves in the first place. And I believe that really goes straight to the secret of why we love aliens so much. Yeah, <clears throat> I feel like, like, like you said, I think aliens are is for some reason or other a very strong part of culture like you you sort of 
almost every child has at some point thought about aliens in some context, maybe because of you say it's so um, like prevalent in all of these different yeah. media and books and stories and films. You just can't really avoid it, can you? Um, no, really interesting. Thank you. Um, Hubert, so how are you looking at this from the kind of conspiracy theory misinformation yeah. angle? Thanks, Tom. So when we're approaching aliens from the angle of misinformation or relatedly fake news or conspiracy theories or disinformation, all these kind of related terms, um, and one really interesting thing we found in our research is uh, on health, mis health misinformation is that the same producers that put out uh, a, a lot of this health misinformation often publish articles on uh, conspiracy theories to do with UFO sightings and aliens, um, sometimes to claim, for example, that the government is, is hiding information um, or re secret research or things like that. So what I'd like to do is just kind of give an example of that. And on the first slide, uh, you'll hopefully see something that was just published a couple weeks ago when I was putting these slides together. Um, and on the next slide, I've just copy and pasted the very first few paragraphs. And I uh, just want to highlight how we might kind of cr uh, critically approach some of these uh, texts and media. Uh, and as Tom and someone have talked about, how these, especially as aliens, is such a prevalent part of our um, cultural sphere. Um, and I, so what I've done with the, the text is in um, uh, all of these paragraphs, the first sentence or so, uh, which is not highlighted, will be kind of uh, commonly known or popular science. So things like Albert Einstein came up with E equals MC squared. Um, and then the second or third sentence, which I've highlighted, are things that you might be a little bit dubious about or something you might want to uh, challenge or kind of question and, and see if that makes sense to you. So maybe if we kind of draw our attention to the third paragraph at the bottom of the page, where uh, it claims that, oh, so Albert Einstein has come up with E equals MC squared, um, and that's something to do with energy and mass. Uh, and then it says something about ancient cultures have had uh, this knowledge about converting energy to mass for um, many, many millennia, many thousands of years, um, but have only selectively chosen to pass it down uh, over the years in a kind of secretive manner again. And um, well, we know that's definitely not true. You might know from perhaps your chemistry classes that uh, a lot of chemical reactions and nuclear reactions will involve interchange between energy and mass. And so uh, it's definitely something we know about. Um, and then, uh, so just a kind of example there. And on the last slide, um, I've put, uh, so what we've seen is that some of these producers will kind of put out this uh, kind of conspiratorial or uh, often definitely inaccurate uh, information very strategically to try and convince you of something or to kind of push an agenda that they might have um, about the government, about vaccines, or, or whatever it may be. Um, and on the bottom uh, of the slide, I've put together kind of five categories that we've used before in our work to try and um, categorize and understand a little bit better what um, misinformation producers, uh, uh, the char characteristics that they would have. So going from left to right, we have professionalism, and this is to do with whether uh, an article that's written will have cle clearly stated author, uh, or it might be a little bit vague, or they might just say, we are publishing from uh, the news outlet, uh, and um, not declaring clearly who's written it can be a sign of, uh, of something that you might want to question. Uh, and then the second category is to do with the language that uh, these articles might use, in intentionally very uh, emotionally provocative uh, and trying to get you to, to react and often paired with imagery uh, to the same effect. Um, then the third one is to do with the factual content of it, you know, how accurate are the claims that they're making, and we've already seen an example of that, um, but also how well have the things that they're claiming been referenced, and you might think back to Wikipedia pages that you've seen that have loads of links, and, and those, are, those are good. You want to have lots of references to reputable sources. Uh, then bias, and the fourth category is to do with uh, potentially um, a lot of political bias, so either very extreme uh, on one side of the spectrum or the other, uh, and that can be also uh, a flag. And then finally is to do with the visual presentation of it. Um, are they trying to copy the, the layout, the fonts, the kind of um, structure of their websites to two reputable sources like the BBC or say the New York Times. Um, and so that's kind of the, the angle I've been bringing to aliens. <laughs> yeah, I think really, really important, just like life lessons, right? In terms of being <laughs> able to spot, like you said, potentially fake news type things, not only about aliens, but also about really important things like 
health information and stuff like you say, which, um, which you're working on. Thank you, Hubert. Um, and then Becky, what are we thinking from astrophysics? Yeah, so I think uh, when we ask, do aliens exist? I think there's two questions here that we have to think about. Like, the first one is, is there life elsewhere in the universe? And the second one is, are aliens among us, right? Have they visited, visited us here on Earth? The first one I think we can actually tackle with science. <laughs> and as a scientist, you know, we like proof and we like probabilities and stuff like that. And this can help us actually understand, you know, whether there is life out there in the universe. So I'm going to show um, just a visual here now. This is what's called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. So it's an image that was taken by the Hubble Space Telescope of a patch of sky that's in the Southern Hemisphere that is the darkest patch of sky that we know. So the, the darkest patch means there's very little light there, there's very little stars, galaxies, everything like that. It is 5% of the size of the full moon. It's only a 30th of a degree, so 360 degrees round in a circle, a 30th of a degree across. So it's a tiny, tiny patch of sky. In it, there are five stars. They're the things that sort of look like, uh, almost like, um, like a crosshair, right? There's a crosses where, where the stars, sort of the light has bled. Everything else that you can see in that image, from the beautiful spiral things that you see, the tiny little, barely even a pixel of light, is a galaxy of a hundred billion, if not a trillion stars out there in the universe. Galaxies are literal islands of stars. Our own galaxy is the Milky Way. It has a hundred billion stars. Our nearest neighbor is the Andromeda galaxy. It has a trillion stars. And even in this tiniest of patch of sky, we see 5,000 of these things. So if we were then to think about, OK, take this image, think about there's 5,000 galaxies in that tiny patch, and then we extrapolate across the whole sky, 360 degrees round this way, 360 <laughs> degrees round this way, in every single direction, you then get at a number of the number of galaxies in the entire universe of about 100 billion. But that's using the darkest patch. There's probably a lot more galaxies in other patches of sky. So let's round that number up to a trillion galaxies in the universe. Each of those probably has about 100 billion stars in it. So then you get at the number of stars in the universe. And that comes out as 100 sextillion stars, Tom. <laughs> which, if you didn't realize, was a one with 23 zeros after it. So it's a huge, huge number of stars. And then you've got to think of, well, how many of those stars have planets around them? Like our sun has eight planets, not nine, sorry, Pluto, has eight <laughs> planets around it. So do other stars in the universe and in our own galaxy have planets around them? Still working on that, but we think the answer is yes, the majority do. And then we come back to the Drake equation. And we come back to whether, well, can these planets host life? First of all, is it intelligent life as well? And obviously Frank Drake got a huge range of things. If we're incredibly, incredibly conservative and think about the fact that you know not all planets will form in the Goldilocks zone where it's not too hot and not too cold. Also, you know that you've got enough time for life to evolve. It took 4.5 billion years for life to evolve on Earth. That's a really long time. So you have to have a star that's around for that long as well. Not all stars live that long. So we've got to think about if we're very, very conservative, right? And we come to the idea that maybe something like one in a quintillion stars might have life or might have a planet that can host life. That's a one with 18 zeros after it. <laughs> then you get a number that's around about 100,000 planets in the universe that could host life. That's a conservative estimate. You could say, OK, well, Earth is one in our galaxy. Maybe there's one planet in every single galaxy that could host life. But there's still a trillion galaxies out there. So in my head, yes, life in the universe has to exist out there somewhere. Are they among us now and have they visited us is another <laughs> completely different question. And it comes back to all this idea of fake news and false information as well, because the majority of apparent alien sightings uh, generally very concentrated in the USA, let's say, um, which is <laughs> anomalous when you think about it from a scientific perspective as well. Um, and also, if we think about the scales involved, if there are more planets just in our galaxy, the Milky Way, our city of stars, it's 100,000 light years across. So even if you could travel at the speed of light, which according to how we understand physics is impossible, it's definitely impossible to travel faster than it, it would still take you 100,000 years to travel from one side of the galaxy to the other. 
So I think it's incredibly unlikely, even if there is life in our galaxy, that we'll even be, ever be able to travel between worlds or they'll be able to come to us. So no, I don't think that aliens have ever, ever visited us or will ever be able to in the future either. But I'd be very happy to be proven wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be fun, wouldn't it? Um, no, I'm, I, just to pick on something you mentioned um, there about saying it's, you know, the number you were getting was potentially 100,000 other, mm. or maybe even a billion or trillion other potential planets that could have life. So the thing um, that Frank Drake sort of, or the quote that's sort of attributed, attributed to him for his equation mm. is basically saying, where is everybody? Yeah. When he wrote down this equation, it sort of was with the context of, well, where is everybody? Because it looks like there should be mm. other civilizations. So that's sort of brings on to your second point there, I think about, well, just because they exist, it's then how do they get here and how do we interact with them because mm. of we can't go faster than the speed of light. Yeah, I but even like. like communication, right? I mean, we've only been sending radio signals out into space for 80 years. Yeah. You know, so <laughs> where is everybody? It's only got to 80 light years away and there's not that many stars in 80 <laughs> light years. So, you know, it's another one of those issues. So it's it like is. time. Have we, have we been around long enough? Have we waited long enough? Mm. You know? Yeah, lots to ponder, everybody, no doubt. Um, so thank you very much uh, to the panel there. So you've heard from our, our three panelists on, on you know, their, I guess, approach or way of thinking about this question, do aliens exist? So now I'm going to be putting your questions to all of them. So um, we've had a few come in so far. Please do keep uh, sending those in. So just pop your question in the chat. And if you add your name and your school, I will read it out. And then we can hopefully also send you a prize if you win the competition. Um, so I'd actually like to start uh, with a question for you, Simona, um, which is, so you mentioned this idea of aliens being presented in, in a literature kind of setting. So has that changed over time? Are there any sort of trends we can identify in how we perceive aliens? Yes, well, of course, it has changed. Um, what is curious to know, I think, is that actually the idea there, mi there might be life out there is very, very ancient. Um, it was present, for example, in ancient Greece and um, at least three centuries before Christ. But then Plato and Aristotle came and they dismissed this idea completely. So um, it fell in this regard um, throughout the medieval period. Um, then um, it came in vogue again around uh, 16th, 17th century. Uh, but the, the way that people considered this kind of problem at the time was completely different from the way we consider it today. They were more concerned with questions uh, related to theology. That is, if aliens do exist, what does that mean um, with respect to our place as the pinnacle of divine creation. How does that relate to the problem of original sin also, for example? Um, and then of course, uh, this changed, especially um, towards the end of the 19th century when modern theories of evolution uh, became popularized, both for the scientific community and the general public. Um, and in fact, a novel such as The War of the Worlds heavily, heavily relies upon theories of evolution. Um, then in modern times, as I said, we had phenomena such as um, the UFO mania of the 50s. Um, and still today, um, we, we usually find the alien discussed in fiction as a um, analogy for the other. That is, uh, fictions that deal with alien beings usually uh, focus on the question, if the other does exist, how do we relate to them in a moral way, in an ethical way? Mm. Interesting, thank you. Um, okay, uh, Hubert, one for you. Um, how has social media impacted the way we share knowledge? And I guess here, probably thinking in terms of conspiracy theory, fake news, maybe even specifically about aliens. So how has social media impacted all of this conspiracy theory sharing of information? Yeah, there's a lot to say about that. And I think um, definitely think social media has made it easier for us to share information in lots of different channels. And um, again, kind of thinking back to what I was saying earlier, 
uh, it's easy for things to be taken out of context um, and kind of mixed in with other messages as we, as we share them, not necessarily even in an intentional way from uh, the way it, something was originally produced, but in the way that it's kind of um, daisy-chained along the way when one person forwards something on Facebook, for example, or reposts something in a Facebook group. Um, and that's one of the ways social media has changed how conspiracy theories can, pro um, can propagate. Um, but uh, uh, for example, kind of sticking with Facebook, um, you, you have Facebook groups and it's easier nowadays for um, different pockets of kind of conspiratorial thinking to maybe find homes in different pockets of the internet, have various Facebook groups or uh, um, other websites that provide similar functions. So um, it has and I think um, you know, one of the best things we can do uh, individually to kind of approach these things is to quite try and critically think as I try to highlight and really question things that um, maybe seem new or potentially strange um, and maybe it's totally harmless and kind of very exciting and new information um, like hopefully what we're learning today but um, sometimes it can be uh, also dangerous. Mm. Mm. Even like the, the, the phrase conspiracy theory mm. is dangerous for science right because mm. in science a theory is something that's not a hypothesis it's not an idea that you've come up with to maybe explain it but you don't have the proof for yet a theory is, is accepted right mm -hmm. and when you hear people like say Shane Dawson with his conspiracy theory series where he talks about like oh it's just a theory mm -hmm. you know, like something that's just a theory is accepted it's like the theory of evolution the theory of general relativity it's something that science has said yes to Absolutely. what they mean when they talk about it is like conspiracy hypothesis <laughs> <laughs> but it's so against like what science teaches us right so it's even combating that on social media must be so Absolutely. difficult Absolutely, and it's kind of taking some of these accepted terms mm -hmm. in, in scientific discourse and um, to kind of give themselves a little bit more credibility and saying, well, yeah, well, it's a theory, or, or you know, we um, using claiming that we've got backed by science, or um, using big words, or um, kind of taking borrowing again, borrowing from a language that already exists in in kind of serious um, debate and kind of uh, scientific inqu inquiry to to um, really muddy, muddy the waters. Really, mm. I found the thing you mentioned of the example of the first sentence being mm. something that you just accept yeah. and everyone agrees with and then immediately following mm. it with something dodgy like that's i hate to say it, it's a very clever tactic isn't mm. it like yeah. <laughs> so it's you have to be very careful too. like yeah okay um and becky yes. um i quite like this question that's coming from anna Dencher. anna thank you for your question uh which is what is the nearest planet that could develop life Ooh. Or in general, do we know of certain planets that we've been like, these are in the Goldilocks zone, these are kind of possible things that could have life? Yeah, great question, Anna. Um, people got very excited a couple of years back when we found a planet around our nearest star, only four light years away. So it's around a star called Proxima Centauri b, which is um, a red dwarf star. So it's a lot smaller and cooler than the sun. And the planet is really close to it. But because the star is smaller and cooler, it means the planet is still in its Goldilocks zone. So it could be a very sort of different kind of world, like the sky, the sun would look very, well, the star, I guess, not the sun, but like if you were, you know, we may call it your sun, it would look very red in the sky um, as opposed to, but that could be the nearest, but obviously that's not confirmed or anything, whether that does have life or even the conditions, it could be that it's so close to its star that the atmosphere might have not, you know, been held onto by the planet. I mean, in our own solar system, we look as well towards places like Mars and Venus. Uh, just last year, there was the discovery of a molecule called phosphine, which is a, um, a phosphorus and then three hydrogen atoms, which is a, uh, a molecule that can only be made on Earth in industrial processes and by cows digestion <laughs> um, and so people got quite excited because like pretty sure there's no cows on Venus yeah. um, there's no industry but it could be some unknown chemical or unknown geological process but it's also made by um, bacteria that live in very extreme conditions so like near undersea thermal vents or something like that so people got very excited could there be like these extreme of bacteria living in Venus's atmosphere Obviously, Mars, the idea of Martians has been around for a very long time. We did think Mars used to have like liquid water on its surface mm -hmm. and would have been a very habitable place in the past when it had a yeah. thicker atmosphere. The sun has basically just bombarded Mars with radiation. It's got no magnetic field to protect itself. That's been stripped away. But that's why there's so many rovers on the surface of Mars right now searching for like fossilized life or maybe some bacteria. Again, extreme stuff that's survived it. So it could be that there is life in our own solar system. And that would be really exciting because then we could test, well, does it look like life on Earth? Is it similar? Did it follow the same sort of evolutionary path that the theory of evolution has taught us um, here on Earth? 
or is it completely separate? And that could answer questions of, well, where did life on Earth come from as well? There's this is that idea called um, panspermia, which is the idea that comets brought the ingredients for life to Earth, right? They got all the ingredients out the cupboard and then Earth was the oven, essentially. <laughs> um, but they could have also brought those ingredients to other planets, and in mm. which case you would have then started with those same things and life strands would look the same across the, sol the solar system. And uh, that's why, you know, it wouldn't just be exciting to find life on Mars or, say, on Titan or something, one of Saturn's moons, because then you'd be able to ask the question, well, does it have the same origins as life on Earth? And that would be an even bigger thing about, like, where do we all come from yeah. and divine crater and all that kind of stuff. So this is why we astronomers get so excited about <laughs> life somewhere else. It's not just because we're like, yay, life. It's because it's like, answer the biggest question. You know, you're, you're making me excited just listening to you talk about this. Like, I want to go and study all of these things now. Like, this is awesome. Um, OK, so we've got a, a general question, which mm -hmm. I, I don't know who potentially could answer this. So I'm going to throw it out to everybody. Um, from Jakob Wagdi. So thank you, Jakob, for your question. If we receive signals from outer space, how are we prepared to deal with this? Is there a special protocol of some sort? So I know this isn't subject specific, but I'm just wondering if any of you happen to know, or perhaps maybe Simona, how have, you know, can we take examples from literature perhaps of how people have imagined how we would interact if we were contacted? That's, that's a super interesting question and the problem specifically of alien language and how to understand an alien language um, has been at the centre of many, many very interesting works of science fiction. Um, there are also works that speculate that an alien intelligence, mi intelligence might be so different from us that we wouldn't even understand their sending uh, to us a coded message meant to be understand, understood as language. And that might be, they might go both ways. They might not understand that our signals are um, coded. They are meant to really um, transmit information. Um, for example, um, Arrival, the movie that's, co that's come out just um, a few years ago, is based on a short story by Ted Chiang called Story of Your Life. And that's all about how this linguist, um, Dr. Banks, tries to um, establish a communication with these alien uh, beings that come to Earth. And uh, it turns out at the end that this language that the aliens are trying to teach to Dr. Banks opens up a whole new um, cognitive state where um, the humans who learn this language can experience past, present and future at the same time. And this is one of the ways that science fiction has, has, explore, has explored the possibility of an alien language as something so much different um, from our own that communication might be close to impossible. So that's, yeah, that's um, a problem that science fiction has addressed in many, many ways. <laughs> is, um, this has just reminded me of um, an interview I did with a, a mathematician uh, called Ian Stewart, who's based at Warwick University. And um, he talked about this idea of um, could we like have an interstellar traded maths? <laughs> because any <laughs> example which I, which I love, Universal obviously. Language. But because he was kind of saying, because this is one of the things, one of the messages that we send out, like you mentioned, Becky, like mm. one of the things we do is we send out math signals of like mm. prime numbers, binary. Mm. We try and think yeah. what's the simplest or what's the most universal thing we have on Earth that might be able to be understood by mm. other civilizations. And he was saying, well, you know, if you have um, alien life existing on a gas giant, for example, their entire being is all very continuous and very much to do with flow and fluid. Mm. So they might understand something we don't understand on Earth called the Navier-Stokes equations, <laughs> which is what my PhD thesis is on. So they might know that, and then you know, and then like you know, we could literally like trade them and be like, oh, it's because of their experience of mm. their local thing. So I think it's really interesting to, yeah, with what you were mentioning yeah. about how they interpret things differently. Yeah. And, and there, is, there is a recent book uh, called Children of Time by Adrian Tchaikovsky where the first contact between um, a human observer and a race of 
spider aliens on our planet, I'm not going into details, <laughs> but the first contact is made through um, mathematical problems. Mm -hmm. the, un go. the human mm -hmm. observer sends out these mathematical problems and this race of spiders solves them and sends a question back. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> that's Help me with my homework, please. Really. <laughs> but it does remind me of Contact as well, the, the film with Jodie Foster that's based on the novel by Carl Sagan. Right? Sagan. They um, detect a signal which is encoded on a frequency that we know that hydrogen emits. So mm -hmm. hydrogen in the universe gives out a very specific like color of light, very specific frequency, wavelength of light. And so they encoded it in that signal that you know is such a common thing that we see wherever you look in the universe. Wherever there are stars, wherever there's gas, you see this signal. And so to encode it in that is almost like encoding maths or something like that. Mm -hmm. It's something yeah. that they know we'd recognize. And in that film, like it's it's very um, funny how like they immediately realize it can't be something natural because it's so regular what they're detecting. Um, and almost overnight, the media descends on the observatory. And I think that's very different to probably what would happen in real life, because there's, there's been a lot of examples in history where strange signals from space have been detected and people, like, first of all, went to aliens, right? So, for example, when pulsars were detected at the end of the 60s by Jocelyn Bell Burnell in Cambridge, the press were like little green men like in fact like the, the the first thing it was like written lgm1 the signal right and and but that wasn't immediately overnight that people knew about it there was the science was done behind it to publish it and to to, to sort of announce it to the world we've had fast radio bursts in the last sort of like 10 15 years as well that have been detected that have been regular radio pulses that were unexplained and again, like that was announced, but like you don't immediately jump to aliens. We have this this mm. phrase in astrophysics that it's never aliens. <laughs> it's never <laughs> aliens until it is aliens, right? Because there's so many other things that it could be, that it'd be more likely to be, because there's so much that we don't know than we do know. So even like fast radio bursts, we're slowly realizing that they're probably from something called a magnetar, which is a special type of star, and very, very dense, almost like the, the baby brother of a black hole. It's not quite a black hole yet kind of thing. Um, you can still see it. And so, you know, all of these things have, we thought they were aliens and then they never turn out to be aliens. So, you know, don't, what it, what's the thing in medicine that they say as well? It's like, um, um, if you hear hoofbeats, don't think don't zebras. Think <laughs> think <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah, if you hear hoofbeats, don't, he, uh, don't think zebras is basically the astrophysical equivalent of it's never aliens. <laughs> <laughs> so. Brilliant. Uh, and actually, that's very similar to a question that came in from uh, Sullivan Upper School. Hello, Sullivan Upper School, <laughs> joining us. Because um, they've actually said, I think this one was it, uh, meant to be aimed for Hubert, sort of said, what if aliens had already contacted us, but we didn't have advanced enough technology mm. to receive the messages? Do you think that could be possible? Or is there a particular type of technology we have that sort of with what Becky was discussing, mm. is there a best way to send a signal? Like, do you have any you know, approach on that from working in the Internet Institute? <laughs> uh, um, nothing magical that comes to mind, but also having listened to Becky talk about the chances that we have been contacted, I'm now a little bit less confident. <laughs> <than we have. laughs> um, but uh, I guess what it reminds me of, and I guess it doesn't directly answer the question, but um, kind of uh, types of contact that we, we um, might imagine that we don't understand, or, we talk about AI all the time yeah. nowadays, and maybe not necessarily a carbon-based life form like we are, but I don't know something completely different. And, and maybe the way that um, the kind of machines or the biology works is something that we were completely unfamiliar with. So mm -hmm. possible, but totally speculation. And <laughs> <I don't laughs> it's a fun yeah. question to yeah. think about. It is isn't cool it? <laughs> because it's also like, well, how do they how do they interact with the world? Because mm. obviously we interact, we see light. We see a very narrow region of the light spectra, but if we could see in a broader amount of wavelengths of light, would mm -hmm. we be able to see mm -hmm. alien signals rather than yeah. detect alien signals with a detector or something? Mm -hmm. You know, can they even interact with light? Are they sending signals in different ways? That mm -hmm. kind of thing as well is really interesting to think of. And it's also, I remember uh, thinking a while back about, as I was thinking about uh, Game of Thrones and winter is coming, and whether you could actually have a planet around a star where winter would be coming, like it wouldn't be as it wouldn't yeah. be as like predictable as ours is, like every twelve months, and you'd have to be able to be like you know how many years it would take. Then I started thinking about if you had what's called a binary star system, where you have two stars orbiting each other, and you had a planet in the middle, mm -hmm. it would be permanent daylight. Mm -hmm. So they'd never be able to see the stars at all. Mm -hmm. So you won't be able to see the night sky. So would, would anything drive forward their technology? Because a lot of technology being driven forward has come from 
astrophysics, like digital cameras, yeah. Wi-Fi, this kind of stuff, like imaging techniques we use in medicine. You know, a mm. lot of that has come, and all early philosophers and stuff would, would philosophize about yeah. the night sky. So if that had didn't exist, would an alien race even have gotten as far as we had in terms of technology? Like, what would their technology even look mm -hmm. like, especially if they're not a carbon-based life form? Mm. If they're a yeah. silicon-based life form, we use silicon to build technology. Would that be, like, absolutely <laughs> horrendous to them? So, like, <laughs> silicon-based tech when you're all made of silicon or something? I don't know. Yeah. But, like, it's really interesting to think about, like, I think it comes back to this idea of it's limitless what you can do with sure. aliens, right? There's so many different areas that yeah. you can explore because the universe is, is so vast mm. as well, right? The universe could have done so many different things as well. It's fantastic that you mentioned this thing of never seeing the stars because one of the uh, one short story, um, it's called Nightfall by Isaac Asimov. Mm. It postulates that um, there's this planet where uh, it's about human beings though. They never see the night sky, but they do every um, 2000 years, something like that. Um, and every time that happens, and they actually see the stars in the sky, they go into a sort of mass hysteria. They completely <laughs> lose their mind. It's a fantastic story. <laughs> so yeah, it's just to comment on the impact that the um, cognizance of a vaster universe around us mm. makes, do, what it does for us psychologically. Mm -hmm. mm. Yeah. So we've got a great question from George Abbott School. Hello, George Abbott School. Uh, who wants to know, what is the definition of an alien? Ooh. I think it's a really interesting question, which possibly could be answered, possibly from everybody. <laughs> um, I think we'll go, Becky, let's go to you first, because you kind of touched on this a little bit. Yeah. About just then saying, um, you know, could it be carbon versus silicon? Like, yeah. how are we going to define I, th I mean, I think, I think alien, I mean, life elsewhere in the universe, to call it alien, I think the definition of alien essentially means something not from Earth. Okay. The problem comes with that idea I was talking about before, is if it has a common origin, you yeah. know, from sort of comets or something, mm. is it then truly alien? Um, and then you would might go into the idea of like, mm. well, is it, does it have a different makeup to us mm. um, completely? Like, is it, does it not need water to survive? Does it need something like methane to survive or something like that instead? Then maybe that you, you'd cast it as alien. But I think alien would be anything not Earth-based. That was like alive? Yeah, 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 yeah <laughs> like, definitely. Like, like, like if you find microbial okay. life on Mars, that would be alien to me. Okay. Right? That would still be an alien. It so might it be a tiny bacteria, it might be kind of boring, but it would still be an alien. <laughs> but we wouldn't class that as intelligent. No, life exactly. The there is, yeah, okay. there is a definition there. But I think alien, intelligent life comes under the header of alien. Yes, yeah. I see. And um, Simona, is there any sort of, I guess, standout examples from a personal perspective <laughs> of ways that aliens have been portrayed that are very, very different, perhaps, to the image that most people would have? I'm just wondering if we've got any, like, you know, like like we were saying, like maybe silicon based things. Like I can't even picture what that would look yeah. like because yeah. I'm so like, kind of you're used to seeing something vaguely resembling a creature, mm. like yeah. a carbon based life form. Yeah, um, yeah. Um, I wouldn't address this question from a visual point of view, but I'm going to present this example. Um, there is a book called Blind Sight by Peter Watts, mm -hmm. and what it does in in this book is very um, conceptually challenging. He postulates it, the existence of this kind of alien um, who is intelligent, highly, highly intelligent, more intelligent than human beings, but it's not self-aware. It doesn't have a consciousness. Mm. So for example, this human, this human crew that goes um, out exploring where this alien is in space, they manage to establish communication with, with them mm -hmm. Um, and it seems that the attempt uh, succeeds. The alien answers back in, in English, if I'm not mistaken. So the, the communication goes on um, perfectly uh, fine. But the thing is, the linguist on this crew gradually realizes that even though the alien is responding correctly, it doesn't really understand what is going on. It's intelligent and therefore mm. it's, uh, it has managed to decode human language but it doesn't really understand the concepts that are behind the words that are being mm. used. So mm. it basically the couple's intelligence and consciousness. That's very challenging from yeah. you know, a conceptual mm. point of view. And that is always the example that comes to mind uh, for me when I think about the alien as something so different that we can barely mm. conceive it. What about like The Host by Stephanie Meyer comes to mind for me, like the author of Twilight. It's very highbrow what I'm talking about <laughs> right now. Um, but the aliens in that are very intelligent, conscious, but they have 
no body of their own mm -hmm. and they're implanted into okay. to humans and the, or they, they talk about different lives on other planets where you know they were gr they were sea grass at one point on a water world you know and they can mm -hmm. that always challenged my conception of what an alien might be is that it yeah. would be happy both being in grass and a human at the same time an intelligent being but that had no body of its own yeah the idea of the alien invading our own bodies is a mm. very old idea also in, the sci in, in, in science fiction mm. writing uh there's a story by robert robert silverberg for example called passengers but it's about this um alien invaders who are invisible and they um take on a human body for a limited amount of time and then live, the, then live their lives completely confused as to what went on in those days where they were being possessed mm -hmm. in a sense. So yeah, that's an idea science fiction has played with as well. Right, I, I'm afraid we're out of time. Oh. Um, so I want, a, I want an answer, yes or no. Do aliens exist? What From a literary think? perspective, we don't know, but we can speculate about it. Okay, that's, really that's really non-committal. Yes, no. non <laughs> yes or no? I'm going to say yes because I hope so. Becky? <laughs> yes, but they'll never be here. And I'm going to say yes as well. <laughs> all right, so <laughs> thank you. Um, huge thank you to our panel. Thank you. Huge thank you to all of you for joining in and sending in your questions. We'll announce the winner of the competition uh, by the end of the week. Uh, do check out oxplore.org for more uh, big questions. And we'll see you all at the next live stream. <laughs>